G'day viewers. So in this segment we're going to talk about the components of a network so that we have a model to work with. Okay, so without further ado, let me draw a model of a network. We'll have a, a node here. And let me connect that to another node. And actually I'll add four of them. Nodes are connected by something called a link. It's providing connectivity between the two. And to some nodes, to, to one here and maybe here, I'll also attach what's called an app or an application. This is something that's using the network. These are the basic components in a network. Let me clear that up. And we have this model here of a network. Now you'll notice here that actually there are nodes are serving two kinds of purposes here. So if I look at this node here, you see that it really exists to support an application and provide it with an access to the network. So a node is a generic name. And I'll use a more specific name, a kind of node here, to refer to a node which supports an application at the edge of the network, and that's a host. Similarly, you'll notice that in here, these devices, while they're nodes, they also are, they exist really to relay messages from one node to another using links, rather than to provide service to applications at the edge of the network. I'm going to call this a router as a, as a name for this kind of node. And also, I'll make one other change to this network just to show the flexibility. We have applications attached to the node or the host on the left and the right. So this is another host here on the right. And this is another router. But to the host on the left, I'm going to add another application. This is just to show that um, a host can support more than one application. They can multiplex applications. Let me clean it up. And we have this kind of network. So this is our model of a network. We have here all of the different parts which are key for a network. And I'll just go over some of them briefly and remind us of what they are. We saw applications or apps. Um, I'm, sometimes we might even call this the user. The key function here is to provide a device which uses the network and obtains service from it. So if we're talking about the user, we don't really mean the physical user here, but really a program run on behalf of a user. Examples are all of the programs you usually run uh, that make use of the network. Things like Skype, iTunes, Amazon, the Amazon website, and so forth. Uh, the other component here were the, the things uh, on that supported applications. We'll call this a host, or sometimes an end system, or an edge device, node being the generic name, or a source or a sync. These, these really are different names to indicate a network element that supports applications. And examples of these are all of your familiar computational devices, laptops, mobile phones, desktop computers, and so forth. Then we had the router. Um, and you, sometimes you'll hear other names, uh, switches, nodes, again a generic name, a hub or an intermediate system. Really all of these devices exist to relay messages between the different links within networks rather than support applications. Now actually there are important differences between devices such as routers and switches depending on the functionality that's inside of the device. And we'll get to all of that later on in the course, but for now I'm just pointing out that all of these devices exist within the network to relay uh, messages across links to, so that they can get from one place to another. And you've probably already seen at home different kinds of uh, routing devices or intermediate systems. Uh, things like your wireless access point or your cable or DSL modem boxes are all serving this role of relaying messages. And finally we have a links or sometimes channels, whose purpose is to connect all of the nodes so that we can actually get the messages across. Besides wires, uh, there's also the case of wireless. Wireless is providing a link. It's really uh, providing a way to relay, uh, to connect the different nodes so that messages can be relayed. Okay, so let's drill in a little bit more detail on some of those. And in particular, I'd like to talk about links. We just sort of draw a link like this. Um, but actually, there are several kinds of links. Often it will be apparent from the context of knowing more than you can see on a high-level diagram. Let me just talk briefly. Uh, many of the links we'll look at are what's called full duplex links, meaning they can be used in both directions, they're bidirectional, and they can be used in both directions even at the same time. So you can send a message from left to right and right to left. That's usually what we'll mean when we draw a line here. This is a full duplex link. Other links are half duplex. Now that means that I can send a message in either direction, from left to right or right to left, but not at the same time. So I have to use either one of these. 
Wireless is a good example of a half duplex medium. You can send a message between two nodes from left to right and then from right to left, but you can't send a message in both directions on the same frequency at the same time, at least not very easily. And finally, for the sake of completeness, I'll point out that there are also simplex links which are unidirectional. They can only be used in one direction anytime. Um, these links are not very common. We really aren't likely to come across them very much because most communication is bidirectional really. And so I'll usually just draw a line like this and will usually mean a bidirectional full duplex link in graphs. Or at least bidirectional, even if not full duplex. Okay, so uh, I also want to talk a little bit about wireless links. This is kind of interesting because wireless um, is an example of a link in which a message when it is sent is broadcast. It's received by all receivers which are within range rather than any one particular receiver. And that's the case even if the message was intended for a particular receiver. So for instance, in here we have a, an access point, an AP, and four different clients. So this would just be your 8211 network. Now when the AP sends a packet, that packet is broadcast. So it's actually sent and it will be received by all of these hosts which are within range, all nodes within range of the AP. Okay, well similarly actually this means that when a particular client here, the node, such as this host here, sends a message back to the AP, its signal will also be broadcast and let's just say it could be received by this node and this node, but not this other node here because that was out of range, it was too far away. Well, goodness, the same thing will happen when another node sends. Let's just say uh, maybe now it has connectivity to here. And I'm going to add a little more just for the sake of completeness. This one maybe can send here and here and here, but not across there. Well, what is, what is this we're ending up with? Uh, the point actually, all I'm trying to make is that it's a mesh. A mess, sorry. We have connectivity, which is not a full mesh necessarily because it's not necessarily complete, but there's a lot of different connectivity here. Our model is not really a very good fit for this because the pattern here is complicated. Instead, what we'll usually do with wireless links is we'll often simply show the logical use to which they're put. In that case, it's this AP is providing connectivity to all of the four hosts individually. We'll show that rather than all of the possible connectivity that could be used in this diagram. Um, and you just have to understand that actually since it's a broadcast medium, these two links interfere when they're used. So it's such that those two links can't be used at the same time. This makes it an interesting kind of link. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, you know, all of the interesting stuff in network where we'll get at the, the effects of wireless and so forth, which we'll see when we get to a lower, lower level of detail. But for right now, our topology for a wireless network will simply look like this, how we're using it logically. Okay, well, so that's all of the components of a network. Now we can build our own networks. Here's a small network, just connect together a couple of computers here, and we're done. Uh, of course, we can also have large networks. Here's a large network. This is a picture of the topology of the Internet2 network. That's a, a large um, educational and research network that's used in the continental United States. The circles here just represent the different sites, which will have different kinds of routers or switches and other equipment. And the lines between them, these are, for example, these would be like fiber optic cables um, between all of these different sites. And this node, you can see that there are really dozens of sites which are exposed here, thousands of miles of cable. This network literally has terabits per second of capacity. This is a huge amount of network capacity. So here we have a really a large network. Now, um, you probably are familiar with many kinds of example networks. As an exercise, actually, I would like you just to stop and think for a moment. Maybe you can pause the video and just try and list all of the different kinds of networks that you could come up with. These networks will commonly be known by either the type of their technology or their use, the purpose to which they're put. So let's just see how many different example networks you can think of. Are you ready to go on? Okay. Here we are. Here's my list. This is not exhaustive. This is just a quick list of the kinds of networks you might come into contact with. There's Wi-Fi or 8211. That's a pretty common network we run into. You might have heard of enterprise networks. This is a network which is run inside a company. Sometimes it'll be called an Ethernet network. Ethernet is the technology which is used to put many of these networks together. There are also ISP networks. ISP is short for Internet Service Provider. That's the network to which your house connects to provide to receive 
uh, internet service, the ISP is providing that service to you. You might also have heard of cable or DSL networks. This is the particular technology which is used to connect to your ISP often. Um, there's of course the mobile phone network. This might be uh, called the cellular network to you. We might talk about 2G, 3G or 4G cellular networks, just different flavors of cellular networks. There are networks in all shapes and sizes. A very small scale network is like a Bluetooth network between uh, say a headset and your mobile phone. A larger networks are the uh, well the, the classic telephone network still exists uh, and also maybe a satellite network connecting um, uh, information from you know the satellites up in the sky down to your GPS receiver or other kinds of satellite phones and so forth and I'm sure you could come up with many things on your list too and things which even aren't here. The point is that uh, the different kinds of components we've seen and the techniques we're going to learn will apply to all of these different kinds of networks. So we'll be able to, our learning will apply to many of them, even though we're not going to go into all of them in great detail. But the concepts, the models, you should be able to draw all of these networks and reason about them using the techniques we'll describe. Well, while we're at it, let me tell you just uh, some other names. Networks are often named by the scale at which they operate. Networks which operate just in a, in a vicinity, a relatively small area, uh, sometimes called a PAN or personal area network. Bluetooth is an example of this, that's just your Bluetooth headset. Other networks operate at a building level scale and a LAN or a local area network is a classic building scale network. Uh, Wi-Fi, which is wireless, or wired Ethernet are examples of these networks. Bigger networks operate at a city scale. You might have heard of a MAN, a metropolitan area network, though this term is less common. The cable and DSL networks that connect uh, all of the houses in the city are examples of this. Some networks operate at a country scale. A WAN, a wide area network, is such a network. And a large ISP is, uh, is a good example of a WAN. And of course there's a network which operates at the planetary scale, which we'll call the Internet. It's really the network of all networks. And that's, that's the thing we're after. Actually I can tell you a little bit more about uh, Internet works. So an Internet work, which we shorten to be the word internet is what you get when you join networks together. Now from our point of view, when you join two networks together you just, you're getting an internet but it's just another kind of network which we can manipulate in the same way. There's also a very special internet work. It's called the internet with a capital I. That's the internet the connection of networks that are all lumped together which we all use every day. And we can also use our simple diagram here to actually start learning things about networks. For instance, I can ask you just about the boundaries of the network. Which part of this diagram shows us what we call the network? What do you think? Take a moment and just think about it. Here's my answer. You ready? Okay, here we go. This is the network. This portion. It includes all of the hosts and routers and links, but not usually the applications of the network. They're an important part of our model, but they're really there to use the network and receive service from it. Similarly, which part represents an ISP? What do you think? Okay, here's my, here's my uh, diagram. This is the ISP. So the ISP typically doesn't include the hosts and applications at the edge of the network. They're really the devices such as your home, which is connecting to the internet, your ISP, to receive service. The service is provided by some network which was, exists within your ISP. It might be two routers connected by a link as shown here, or 200. Actually, it doesn't really matter because your, your hosts are just making use of whatever networking service is being provided. And for this reason, we'll often draw the cloud as a generic kind of network. So this cloud here might represent an ISP. It's a cloud because we can't see what's inside it. And typically, this doesn't matter since we're just obtaining network service from it. And our application should run no matter what's inside it, as long as it's providing enough bandwidth. Okay, and finally, to round out this model, I can also talk about a couple of key interfaces that are on this diagram that we'll get to and provide a more formal treatment of later on. The first interface is between applications and the network. This is the application to network interface. That's interface one. And the second interface here is between the various network components, such as one host talking to another host or routers inside a router in the network talking to each other. So let's look in just a little more detail. Here, this line, this is interface one, it's showing us the network to application interface. It defines how applications are allowed to use the network. And there is a widely used um, interface here called sockets. 
This is used to write many applications on the internet. We'll look at that in a following module. Now when we look at the interface here, the vertical interface, this is interface number two, between the network to network interface, this is between hosts and routers and routers and other routers, this defines how the nodes of the network work together to get packets across the network and provide other kinds of network service. We can't normally from the edge of the network see what's going on inside the network. There is a program however that we can run called Traceroute which will often let us peek inside the network to see what's going on in the network. We'll also look at that in a later segment. Okay, so now you have a model of a network.